And I lifted it. I said, hey, that's not so bad. Why don't you join us on some more here every, every afternoon? I want to tell you, you can't imagine the 180 degrees that I changed. Right now today, I want to thank you, first of all, Chuck, for being here. I mean, best man at my wedding, one of my, my reason for being able to start my company in the first place, we set that up. First partner in my company, you and the lawyer. You, yeah. remember, you remember that? I remember, yeah, what saying. Um, very instrumental in almost everything that I've done here. You've been very instrumental in it, in many ways or another. Even if you don't know that, you have been. It's, you know, so, Lance, hey. But I, I want to thank you for being here, Chuck. Lance, it's you. always, listen, listen to me. People tell me all the time, thank you for doing You got to where you want because of you, not because of you. Need, but you needed a hand once in a while, and that's all you needed. Well, what I'm saying, Chuck, is this. I'm not saying you're my sunshine, but you helped to brighten up. I see you fucking sight of See, now, now you're my sunshine. Anyway, thank you for being here, Chuck. <laughs> Let's start off with, where were you born? The Boston. And, uh, but that was, when people say, well, you're from Boston. No, I actually was born in Boston, then we moved right away. I mean, so we moved all around uh, New England area. Uh, Did you have brothers and sisters? One sister and two half-sisters. Okay. All right. So you grew up, I know a little bit about your background. You didn't have such a happy childhood. You, I mean, you, you said. Well. It, 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 was, it, wasn't, it was by any means orthodox. You did not have a very orthodox childhood. It was not a. Well, I, it, it wasn't bad. I mean, there are people who have much worse childhoods. Well, that's okay, but you can only compare your pain to your pain. Well, yeah, it was it was it was perceived emotional anguish. You know, I was a sick kid. Uh, five years old, I had rheumatic fever, gave with a heart murmur, and so the doctor said, no athletics, no sports, nothing, because if you do, as it is, your your son will probably survive past fifteen years of age. Mm-hmm. So my parents were always telling me how weak I was and how I shouldn't do stuff. And so the trouble with that is that even though. Uh, it was based on concert. I understand that. The effect is it, it imposed a sense, of, a sense of inadequacy, of uh, diminished value. And uh, it's not exactly an inferiority complex. It settles in your subconscious. And so from the ages of until I was 15, I was uh, felt that I was not adequate. You only had sisters. You had two sisters. I only had three sisters. Three sisters, two half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mom and dad stayed together the whole time? So oh, we mother and father divorced when I was five. Mother remarried. She was she divorced her my stepfather at eleven. My grandfather was kind of a, a surrogate father. He was the one that was in your corner the whole time? He was well, interesting enough, he and my grandmother were located in another state and they were working for the McDonald's system. My grandfather went to high school with Mr. McDonald's before Mr. McDonald's started hamburger. Wait, 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 wait. You're talking about in San Bernardino? No. That's the McDonald Brothers, because I know it started McDonald. You're right, my that's Ray where Kroc? the company's located, okay? You mean Ray Kroc? I mean Ray Kroc. Oh, Ray Kroc, okay. So, Ray Kroc, okay, Ray right. Turner. Okay, Ray, right, Ray. Right, so right. these guys knew my grandfather. My grandfather's role was he would open up McDonald's stands, and he would run them and get them going for a few years, buried on the location. And then he would be he would go to another location and open up that location. So he never actually purchased a franchise until the last part of his life. In summers, I would go to work in the McDonald's in, well, when I was 12, but they put me in the stock room because you couldn't be up front because of labor laws or whatever. But I worked for my grandparents to stay with him to the summer. So he was kind of the surrogate father. That worked out all right until I went back. At that time, we were living in Michigan. We got involved with a very bad group of young boys. You're 12 now, are you? In your I team? was uh, between the age of 12 and 15, okay. those three years. Okay. In the summers, I was fine. It was with my grandfather. I worked at a center work, and, and that was fine. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so the money that I made in the summer, I came back, came to my mother, and helped pay the bills. 12 to 15, I had no athletics, and I was getting uh, beat up a lot. You weren't academic at all? You didn't read a lot or do it? No, unfortunately. It was... It's, you know, you know Lance, uh, I never thought I was particularly stupid, <laughs> but my teachers, my teachers said, "Well, you know, this kid has some problems." So academics wasn't your no. Wasn't your I, did right. I did all right. I did all right. And it, you weren't in clearly you were in, weren't into sports because you were told you could couldn't. It'd be a danger to your heart exactly, and everything else. That, it wasn't exactly attention deficit disorder, but I could not study. I just couldn't. I couldn't focus. So I didn't. I still made reasonable grades. I had some uh, serious problems. So. Um, 
when I was 15, because I was in and out of, not, no, I didn't go to reform school. They kept me for a couple of nights. Uh, Who come and get you out, your mom? Or was it just up there? Or your grandfather? No, my grandfather's in another state. So he wasn't even there? No, he wasn't there. No. Okay, so. But, he was, he was only with my grandfather during the summer. So your, step, your stepfather was there? Did he come no, in? No, his stepfather was out of the picture entirely. Okay, so your mother came and got you? Or it was only uh, your sister? Uh, she talked to the police. She worked as a waitress. Okay. So she knew the police. Right. So the police would say, look, we got your son. He's, he's dead. So she would plead with him and they would let me go kind of thing. Stuff, you know, black leather jackets and gang fights, this kind of stuff, which was stupid. That's what it was. People thought that uh, I was going to be in serious trouble as I go. Didn't pay attention to the stuff in school. In in school, you got academic marks. And academic marks weren't bad. Uh, a couple of, well, one or two A's, a few B's. It wasn't, wasn't bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the citizenship marks, you got one was you were a good citizen, five you were a thug. So, so I got... Six, you're getting A, A5, B5, C5. <laughs> so you get two of these things, and they say, okay, well, we're going to give you a little rest from school for about uh, a few weeks. You were kind of expelled, and as a result, you got in more trouble. What really kind of saved me and kind of set the tone for my life, Sputnik saved my life. So the Russians Sputnik put... Sputnik saved your life. Yeah, okay. so the Russians put up Sputnik, right? Right. And so the space race started. And so America was always concerned, well, well, why are the Russians doing this? So why are we so far behind? So they looked at the Russian education system, and they looked at the rigid physical conditioning of Russian children. They said, oh, maybe we're missing the boat here. So they started the President's Council on Physical Fitness. And what they did was they allocated funds to schools to build facilities. Well, my school was one. And they built a gymnasium. And in the gymnasium was this room with free weights. Now, it's not, 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 nothing like we have today. A few barbells, and that was it, really. And all the top athletes of the school during lunch break would go and fool around with the weight room. So here comes the kid, right? I'm 15 years old. Or skinny as a rail. Skinny as a rail. I couldn't dish it out, but I could take it because I was getting beat up on a regular basis. But I was hanging around with a bunch of kids that were not the best kids. And some of these kids were seriously troubled. So I w- would walk by and see him in there. And, you know, the, it would be nice if I was accepted like that. But on the other hand, I'm accepted with my group, so I'll stick with him. So they say, hey, Wilson, I want you to lift, lift this weight. I said, oh, come on, you're just, you're just trying to give me, you're just trying to make fun of me. And the school that I went to had a lot of ethnic difficulties. Did it really? Oh, yeah. I, the gang fights, oh, you had oh, to be with your clique yeah, or you were in a okay, absolutely, you. absolutely. I mean, there a lot of cities had this, you know. So they said, hey, Wilson, come on in. They're trying to fight. So I said, oh, you're just trying to make fun of me again. I'll try. So they put away the bar. And I lifted it. I said, hey, that's not so bad. Why don't you join us on so We're here every every afternoon. I want to tell you, you can't imagine the 180 degrees that I changed literally overnight. Nobody could understand it. Here's a kid that was headed for a life of crime. Okay. Or he's going to get killed in a gang fight. And the next day, he's dressed without the boots and the leather jacket. He's reasonable in class. He's getting ones and twos on citizens. What about your group that you had before? Now, they didn't let you go so easily. You bet I know. Yeah, they did. I had no choice. I said, that's it. I'm done with you guys. No, uh-uh. I said, I'm not fooling any of you guys. These guys, I'm not going to do it. I'm over here now. So Those guys were good. The guys in the weight room? Well, it wasn't total, you know, dis- you know they're angels or anything. But Yeah, but it wasn't that level. But I just didn't associate with them more. I was too busy working out. So I went to the gym, went to that gym. Then... Went to the dump. You know, in the United States, they have dumps where they dump stuff that is convertible, mm-hmm. right? Right, right. So you can buy metal holes on five cents on a dollar. Mm-hmm. I went down with uh, and picked up with a, an acquaintance's father's truck and loaded it up with steel piping. No, wait, wait. You were driving then? No, no, no. The friends. Okay, 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 okay. Friends drive that. Yeah. So uh, went down and we loaded up the truck with pipes. In the United States, uh, fathers will buy, you know, or supportive fathers will buy their kids weight sets, 100 pound, 120 pound weight sets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then three months later, the kids are going to do this. So I was able to buy those weight sets from these kids at 10 cents on the dollar. So I got the pipe. Uh, my friend's father was a welder. So we built the equipment. And I had like, I must have had like 5,000 pounds worth of weights in my basement. I had chains hanging from the ceiling. So not only did I go to school and work out there, but I ran home and spent from 4 o'clock in the afternoon until 10 o'clock. By yourself? By myself. Just lifting weights and reading magazines, what to do. Did everything wrong. 
took a part-time job in a health food store, spent all my money on supplements wait, and, wait, wait, wait. and stuff, and went from 45 kilos to about 90 kilos in about less than a year. And people didn't bother me anymore. <laughs> you don't think it was? Because what you gained was nothing but muscle, though. It's yeah. not like you, became, you didn't become the chubby kid. You became the Hulk. Yeah. So and people didn't bother me. To, and that's what I wanted to be left alone. Now you're 15 or were you? Now it's 15. 15, okay. But the school, if they kicked me out of school, I couldn't go to the gym there. And I couldn't hang around with the, with the athletes. So then I, they said, well, look, if you're as big as you are, you're getting bigger. Why don't you start like a, some kind of athlete? I said, well, my eyes were bad. Always been bad. So I was bad at, at ball-related sports. So basketball, football, couldn't do it. But wrestling I could do. So I started wrestling. And I lost every match the first year. Then the next year did well. And the next year I did better. And the final year I did very well. At the same time, I started at the local martial arts school. Because I was larger, but I was frightened. You were afraid, still afraid. You kidding? Well, all those years, yeah, you, you, your emotional makeup had already been made up. Yeah. By the age of 12. And I can say that from experience, too. And then working with kids all the time and understanding the psychology. From birth to age 12, your emotional makeup is already set. And after that, unless something really traumatic happens, you're basically the same. You'll have that fear constantly. Fear, and not only fear of everybody else, lack of faith in your own Wait, wait, you had no confidence? You, okay, exactly. All the stuff people had told you and you had raised to believe became you. Yep. I'm not worth anything. I'm not strong. And no matter how strong you got, you didn't think you were strong. I, you didn't think you could do it. Unfortunately, it's still with me. Listen. We're both two guys that went through <laughs> very similar things. I think that's why we missed right away. We could see it in each other. Okay, we look good, but there's something inside this guy. But then you start learning everybody to a certain extent has that. Well, you know, everybody to a certain extent. We you know, in the, in the industry, the fitness industry, it, it, people say, well, people will start involve themselves in fitness and health and, and training kind of thing uh, to improve their, their physical appearances or their, their well-being. And that's true. But it has a great deal to do with improving their sense of their own self-worth. And that is the key, I think, with any successful fitness facility, is how do you enhance that person's sense of belief in themselves? That's why, since I had my own barriers to overcome, I can see that in other people. And it does me a great deal of personal satisfaction to be able to assist that person achieve or kind of regain that sense of belief in themselves. Chuck, you know, so now I see, I see something in you that I didn't see before and I can understand it. That's why both of us still work with children because it's pure. We want to catch it before it gets out of hand. Like I said, because 12, and you work with kids younger than 12 as well, after that we can do it, but it takes so much time because they have the same people in their lives telling them the same thing that got them where they're at, and it's difficult. That's why sometimes we really need to pull in the adults around them and say, look, this is what we're, <laughs> what we're giving to your kid. Don't make my job hard for me and I have to redo it every week. Well, you know, I, I tell the kids at the judo class here in the American Club and, and other places too. I said, look, what is judo all about? Judo is about respect. And it's also about self-respect, okay? And it's a respect because you have value. It's because the people that you work with have value. So you have value. Don't let anybody take that away from you. You have value. Everybody understands, you know what value is? Okay. You know, respect is a demonstration of that value. Keep that in mind, because as you get older, people will try and take that away from you. The world will try and diminish your sense of value in your own eyes. Don't handle it. Don't believe it. Okay. If anybody ever tried, you tell them that you come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't get, this, you didn't get that cauliflower in here from, from a plastic surgeon. You, have you guys did for real work. <laughs> you have this 500-pound gorilla on your meal. We got your back here. <laughs> so... That's why. That's a good. That's really good. Okay. So. So. Anyways. So. Uh, I started with the martial arts. It was really getting past the fear of uh, certainly self-respect and self-worth, but also there was a very real fear. I don't know what your circumstance where you grew up, but were you afraid? Of, yeah. Was that fear justifiable? Yeah. When I was. <laughs> when I had a car, fine. I, I bought an old forty-seven Chevy kind of thing with no brakes. That's another story. Uh, I had a machete under the front seat. Guys w who knew me were from other altercations. Four guys in a car would block my car and get out of the car. But I tell you what, you get out of the car and pull out a machete. They start thinking back, they start thinking, back in their car. They start thinking, <laughs> they start thinking about it. And it, it was a bluff. That's right, but it didn't matter. But it didn't matter. <laughs> it didn't matter. <laughs> so the school, before I could go home, uh, school it out. And you didn't go to the bus stop because that was where they were. Where they were. So you had to hide. 
So where are you going to hide? Well, the library was open. And so as a kid, uh, between the, I don't know, it was 12, 15, the books that were interesting were like superhero books. So the, really, they had comic books in the, oh, of course they would. No, they had all of their regular books. Like myth, mythology. Oh, mythology. Read those tell books. Oh, okay. Hercules. Yeah, yeah, guys. exactly. Zeus. Okay. All that, all that. So these were like, you know, superhuman gods. Things. Okay, right. And said, wow, wow, that's great. And they possessed all the things I didn't have. They had courage. They were physically capable. They could overcome, you know, adversity. And so that would, that set in my mind that she had, wouldn't it be great to be like that? Not only that, they had integrity and they had uh, a sense of justice. And I said, wow, that's uh, kind of the person I want to be. And eventually, because I didn't want to be a thug. I had no choice. It was a matter of survival. But it was funny because every time I was in a fight, I would cry because cause this person hated me so much that he wants to kill me, but it didn't stop me from retaliating. But uh, I just I felt so bad that people hated me. And they didn't. They had their own problems, but they hated your actions. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I said, well, I'm going to try and be that person. So when weight training came up and you saw the, you know, the Charles Atlas sand kissing your face kind of that era, I said, wow, I want to be like that. So like I said, built my own equipment, worked out all the time and started the martial art. Because the martial arts, this is oriental martial arts. But the boom hadn't started when you started. Well, in right? town, it, it wasn't a boom. But they were the only one. But they had it. But I, mean, I met with the guy. Guy Bruce Lee hadn't come out. That had because oh, that's what made it flip. Not that era. Into the dragon. That changed everything. And the nunchucks. Right. Because you were doing judo, right? Right. Well, I was doing all of it. All of it. You I did, did judo twice a week and karate twice a week and aikido once a week. Kind okay. of thing. Because it was a, it was a martial arts studio, and the guy I was running it was Stan Sloshanik, who was a European guy. So we started out with self defense course, and that's what I really got me interested. And then I started doing actual. I, Focus more on judo. Some cried, but mostly judo. That was, I did really well. I was, but by the time I got involved with judo, I was large enough to do some damage. But I remember the first time the tournament I entered, somehow my opponent and I got to the mat. And so the, uh, one of the other people, guys at the, at the, uh, at the school said, choke him, choke him. I didn't know what he meant. So I put my hands around the guys and just started choking. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> so, no, I can't do that. Anyways, uh, it was like that, and so I continued to do that. Then I, I got out of, I got high school safely. Um, by the time I got out of high school, I was pretty large. Part-time work at uh, a health food store. And, you know, wintertime, I would do part-time jobs because we still were not doing well financially and gave all the money to my mother. And in the summertime when I worked for my grandparents, it was a different town. Went to one, one summer I went to Sharon, Pennsylvania. One summer I went to St. Louis. The last summer I went to California. That's because of your uncle. I mean, your grandpa. Grandpa. Grandpa, I'm sorry. Don't come on now. Yep. So, oh, come on. so that was... And oh, how old was he? Do you remember that? Yeah, I was... Well, I don't know how old he was, but he had... Uh, what's I, I forget what the name of the affliction. It's a buzzing in your ear. Oh, a t a tinnitus. Tinnitus. He had Thank tinnitus. You. Was yeah. he ever in the service? No. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it was or not. I, I, I never... And he remember. tried to clear it out with the... He took himself out. Because of tinnitus? Yep. Are you sure? Come on. No, it, was am I, am I, I, was I there? No. Yes, I'm sure. The reason why, the reason why I'm saying I had tinnitus uh, from the Air Force being on the flight line. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that's how he, but it, it but, but that didn't help any one bit. And people didn't know, yeah. and they didn't have the knowledge at that time to handle it. So it could have drove, driven him young. Yeah. And it did. Easily. Did he have children? Did he have wife? Was he? Well, and my grandmother. Okay. And of course, in my mother who was my grandmother's. But daughter. that was the only child he had, your mother. Well, he was the second husband of my grandma. Okay. Right. Anyways, so uh, he was he your was he your mother's paternal? I mean, no. paternal. Okay, so he's stepfather. Yeah, stepfather. Stepfather. Okay. Uh, but to me, he was a father. Right. So it it took him. He drank tough way to go. Well, in the in McDonald's stand, you clean out the the. You took him. The, I thought you said he was that. Yeah. Okay, that's how he did it. Yeah, it took him a long time to die. Uh, and at that time, uh, he's a hospital, he died. And, uh, I was with him for a couple of days and he said, you know, take care of your mother, take care of your grandfather for me kind of thing. I did. So well, instead of, you know, I was, uh, cause you're driving 17, you're driving already. You know, cause yeah. you can get your license 15 and a half. Right. So mm -hmm. 17. instead of going back to Michigan, this was in California. So instead of going back to Michigan, I stuck around and tried to take care of my grandmother. And at that time, my great-grandmother was living with us. So I, tr I worked at the McDonald's stand 
to help my grandmother because she was she stayed on because it was a franchise. They owned Stan. There was a franchise for them. They owned it. And interestingly enough, uh, Ray Kroc and Fred Turner came down from Chicago, and for about two week, a week or ten days, they worked the McDonald's. Stand. So you, oh, we worked with them for about a week or so. So history, they, right they, yeah. and they and they said. <laughs> And so when they left, and they said, look, if you ever need a job in the McDonald's system, give us a call. I went and stuck with him for a year. Uh, and then when my grandmother was kind of back on her feet, I went back to Michigan for my final year in high school. And uh, that was okay. And But we were still having money problems. So I went to the local McDonald's stand and asked for a job. And the guy said, well, we're not hiring. Sorry. And I said, look, you don't have to train me. I'm familiar with this, uh, the whole operation. I said, I'm sorry. He said, I'm sorry. I said, we, we don't hire you. I said, well, you know, Fred Turner said if I ever needed a job, I should mention his name. So he stopped. He said, how do you know Fred Turner? And so I explained. I said, yeah, Fred Turner, Ray Kroc, I know them. And they said, really? I said, you can call Chicago and ask. Okay, I will. So he did. And I guess Ray Kroc answered the phone, or, or they got Ray Kroc on the phone. And they said, give this man a job. So they gave me a job. And that's what it was. But see, if you weren't good at what you were doing either, they wouldn't even offer that to you. Yeah. yeah. So the, so how long did you work there? Only about six months, because then I finally got into college. <laughs> What's it? Were you trying to get into college and you hadn't got in uh, um, or something? Or? Yeah, it was the it was the, the times. It was nineteen sixty what nineteen sixty four. So there was the Vietnam War was going on. And you're seventeen, but you're going to be drafted. Well, they weren't drafting. Were they? Boy, they were. Draft. They were. And then they they draft and they had the lottery. Yes. No. And everybody else is going to school. And I right. Because right. you can get the college deferment. No, you couldn't. Not at that time. Not at that. It's 64 now. Anyways, but at that time, at that time, in, in the United States, uh, on the coast, the East Coast and West Coast and colleges, they were always against the war. And it was a big deal. Uh, but in Grand Rapids, Michigan, it was a somewhat conservative area. And some of the people I knew in high school were eager to go. To go. And it was just, uh, it's just an exploration and insanity. I just wanted to go over there and chill us. You're in so, uh, uh, Vietnam, yes. It just didn't see. Even though I grew up in a, in a quasi and uh, violent uh, environment, my children, so, especially somebody I didn't know from a culture I didn't understand. On the other hand, I wasn't necessarily a conscientious objector either. Okay. I just wanted to stay alive, which so my friends didn't particularly care about. Yes, they thought it was going to be fun. Finally, I, I went to school, and, and uh, again, because of my inadequacies or my stupidity or whatever, studying was just never my thing. But I got through it. I, most of the stuff I learned and the grades I got were listening in class. I, that was okay. I had some problems with authority. The school was a beginning school. Only had like three, they didn't have a graduating class, only had three three years. So it was a brand new school. And, uh, but it was cheap and I had to pay it. Okay. And I lived at home and went to, drove to school. But there were some upperclassmen who uh, let the upper class mentality go to their head. And so any freshman had to wear a beanie. For the fellow who tried to put a beanie on my head, not too well. But he got out of the hospital at about a, after a month later. I threw him down the stairs of the library. I said, don't put that beanie on my head. You're a freshman. I'll put the beanie. I said, no, you're not. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'll put the beanie on your head. So no. <laughs> so, is he listening now? I wonder if he's listening. He might see this podcast. He doesn't hear this. So, of course, I got in trouble with the you know, authorities. And I said, he attacked me. He tried to put this beat him, and he attacked me with self-defense that, under the wire. And then there was a uh, philosophy professor who, uh, there was, a, there was a, a student in the class who stuttered. And we were going through Plato's Republic. And he asked this young man to read the page. And the more he read, the more he stuttered. And the philosophy professor said, well, that was... Totally, un- we couldn't understand, so you have to do it again. So I closed my books and, and started to leave the classroom. He says, where are you going, young man? I said, hey, I'm sorry, I'm not going to deal with this shit. And he said, you can't leave, and he put his hand on me. That is self-defense. I didn't hurt him too bad, but scared the crap. And of course. You didn't expect it. You were using what you knew. You know? Yeah. And I just put him against the wall with my hand on his throat. I said, no, never put your hands on So the authorities, school authorities, came in, and I said, I said this guy's terrible teacher. I said, and there are other people who have problems with him. She said, well, we have heard these things, but we can't do anything. I tell you, but if you would circulate a petition, we might be able to do something. So I did and got him released from the You know, 
Lance, my definition of an individual is the degree of their humanity. And I know there are a lot of people who are a lot smarter than I am, and maybe some who aren't. And I know a lot of people who are much more physically capable than I am. But humanity doesn't necessarily rely on your capability. It relies on how much you value your fellow men. And in this day and age, that seems to be diminishing so much. It, it doesn't have to do with anything about religious beliefs or about color of your skin. And that, anyway, it has to do with your basic humanity. So I've always had problems with authority. Somebody who has that level of diminished humanity who tries to impose their authority on me, well, will be seriously disappointed. There are People like Mr. King, you and I know. Fortunately, we settled that particular. You sure did. <laughs> you showed that so well. I refused to live in a fear, and that's why I took up the martial arts. In the martial arts, they teach you to, to you can't run away from your enemy. You confront your enemy. When I was my second year, to finish my second year in college, which was not great, and uh, I applied to a larger school, actually got accepted. What were you studying when you were in? Did you find your passion? general gentility. Oh, because you had to get... So, I was going to go into rehabilitative medicine. Oh, so you already knew. I had got accepted at a, at a school, public school, school of rehabilitation medicine. But at the same time, got uh, a notice to uh, get my physical examination for the draft. It wasn't draft notice. It was, please report to this for... Well, that's because you don't come back from those. Yeah, exactly. You don't come back. Did you already know that, that you weren't going to come back? No, but I sensed it. I know when I got mine. They said, please come down. You don't need to bring anything. It's just a physical check. I said, you're right. So I went to the recruiting office. Exactly. What That's I exactly. I went right down there, looked around, and there's only one that didn't want me. Everybody was, come on, sign up. Like, what do you want to do, young man? <laughs> this guy stand up in a suit, stand like this, just looking at everybody trying to get me in. And it was the Air Force. Yep. And I said, what if I want to join you? He said, you're going to have to get in line. There was a line around the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, after, how long was the test? Was it more than two hours? I well, the test was, well, the test was you had four different areas you tested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, it was more than two hours because yeah. I had to do it. Two of us got in of the 25 people there. I got, no, I wouldn't, there were nobody lined up for the Air Force in my town. No one right? no lined up. Everybody, see, I'm from LA. Everybody knew. Oh. They were lying. Nobody was with these other guys. They, that's why they were trying to give you anything you wanted. Prizes. Grand Rapids. You want a brand new car? Come on, join the Marines. Grand Rapids, <laughs> Michigan. They were packed up and ready to go. The Marines. They <laughs> wanted to go. They wanted to go. Get, 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 get in the Marines. Get in the Marines. Get in the Marines. Get in the Marines. Where's Camp Lejeune? Where is it? But I said, nope, nope. I'm going down to recruit you. So I joined the Air Force. Like right, So I went down to the test. Took the test. And the test was test was uh, catered towards like a 15-year-old education. You thought so? Okay. So I... Did well in all the tests. And they said, well, what? okay, no problem. You're in. Uh, what would you, what profession would you like? I said, well, you know what I really like is a nine to five job with weekends off. <laughs> Is that what you said? That's what I said. Okay. And they said, well, you've got good test scores. Why don't you go into procurement, which is government contracting? I said, okay. Boom. Sign the papers. Boom. You're in. Now, we'd use this. We'd use this. 1960, early part of 66. So I went and got the papers. I went up and got my physical. As you exit the, the physical, right? You get the physical examination. You're all in your skivvies kind of thing. You're leaving. And they got this, like, this six-foot-two Marine in, in dress uniform kind of thing. It's just, you know, every young kid's macho dreaming. And he's sitting there and says, you Marines, you Marines, you, eh. You, <laughs> he's picking people out. And he said, you were, ah, Air Force. He said, get out of here. So uh, I, by the skin of my teeth. So I get out. So that's where my Air Force grew. So I went home. And uh, nobody, you by yourself though. Nobody else had joined the Air Force. Nobody else joined the Air Force. Anyway, so I got in. So you're, it was basic training. It was uh, a walk Scout through. Camp. Well, it was a Boy Scout camp. You spent how long in the Air Force? Well, we, there was an early out program. Right. So uh, three, three and a half years. That's all? It's only a four year commitment. The work was from nine to five. And it was Saturday and Sunday off, except on special duty kind of thing. So I did a lot of stuff. I started the base judo club, and that was to a lot of kids, and that was that was fun. The gym was only available up until five o'clock in the afternoon. I didn't I didn't have any weights in the room. The only place to work out was the gym. So what I would do was uh, I went over there on lunch hour one day when nobody was there. I opened up the window of the second floor of the gym, and then I drive around in the evening when it was dark and I get on top of my car and go in the window and work out and then leave the same way. And I never got caught. So I started the judo club and, and that well and well. And then the Otis Air Force Base is the Air Defense Command, which is they coast they send these radar planes up and down the East yeah. Coast. Well C one thirty four. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so they had Air Defense Command Judo Championship. What was your job? What was your job in the Air Force? Procurement. 
Procurement, okay. Procurement, so. Right. Buy stuff. Right. You know, the guys, you know, right. $500 for a screwdriver. Right, right, right. right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, so I won. They said, well, we're going to send you to the Air Force Championships. So I went to the Air Force Championships, and I did uh, play second. Then they sent you to the all-service championships, and I had to fight in the heavyweight category. And I remember the guy, Bernie Lepkoffer, who was from the Navy. He was a fourth-degree judo player. I was still a brown belt. And we fought to like double overtime, and he won decision. But it was it was sick of place. So, so I won all these. And the rest of the year, and the rest, the rest of the three years, we either I was either competing for the Air Force. I was on the Air Force judo team. So either competing for the Air Force or going to training camps for the Air Force. So we went to every year went to the Air Force championships, went to the All Service championships, went to the American National Championships, and of course, I wanted to go to Japan. What year are we talking now? Sixty-eight. During the interim, I wanted to marry the girl next door. She was uh, literally the girl next door on Cape Cod. This is a guy who's making 100 bucks a week. You know. So I brought the girl to Cape Cod. We lived off base in a cottage, which I could not pay for. And then it was an infatuation. It was nice, but then it didn't work out. So then I took her back home to the hangar of her parents because she had lived in sin with this guy for right, 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 right. And so as a result, I was in serious debt, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. And so I was either facing re-up, re-up and you get $10,000 to re-up kind of thing and then throw yourself in debt for the next four years or you find a job. So I found a job. All on the base, I had formed, the, re-established the judo club and I also formed a self-defense course and civilians came in from around the area. One of the things came was an engineer for Falmouth Electric and Light Company. And I taught him and his wife, and he said, if you need a job, let me know. So I took a month off from the Air Force and went to work as a grunt on power line construction and paid off all my bills. Well, with the guys in construction, we finished work like at 3.30 in the afternoon. They go for a beer at the local place. This was in near the base. There was Felmouth, which was kind of the high-class resort area, and there was Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts, which was not the resort. Right. No, with a name like that. Yeah. Was... And the bar was the hotel bar. And it was a country and western. Okay. All okay. right. With a go-go dance. Oh. <laughs> so a couple of friends of mine who are in the judo club, one was the bouncer and one was the bartender. They said, you want a job? We're leaving. We're going to go to Vietnam. I said, well, yeah. What's it like? Well, it's Friday nights and Saturday nights. And I said, sure. I took that job part-time as a, as a bouncer, a doorman. When you think, well, a doorman, you have to beat people up. You didn't. There were a couple altercations, and after that, uh, it was a decisive win. And they knew, yeah. And they knew, and then they didn't bother you anymore. Yeah. And they didn't try and challenge you anymore. Right. Uh, so that was that worked out all right. And there were a lot of other fringe benefits that went along with the job kind of thing. That was fine. And I paid off all my bills, but I wanted to leave. I wanted to go to, uh, I wanted to, go to Japan. So I said, like yourself, I said, uh, went to the appropriate authority. I said, look, I want to, I want to transfer. I don't want to stay here. I want to go to Japan. Why do you want to do Japan so bad? Because, of course, because of martial arts. Judo. Judo, okay. I mean, you knew they were the world's yeah. best. Yeah. So they said, well, okay, let's see what we can do. So I had a friend in the judge advocate office who was also in the judo club. And he says, we got you assigned to Asia. I said, really? Korea. <laughs> <laughs> it was close. Very close. <laughs> close. You're close. So, so I went to Korea. You took it, yeah. But the good thing about it was when I arrived in Korea, there wasn't a job for it. So it was a job. Okay. Because I've been playing judo for three and a half years, right? Right. right. So what they did, they sent me as a liaison to Seoul because it was Osan Air Force Base, which is 60 kilometers south of Seoul, 60 miles south of Seoul. Mm -hmm. So they sent me to Seoul as liaison. So I had a truck, and I lived at the YMCA. You didn't stay at the Army base there? No. Okay. I stayed at the YMCA. So you got per deal. Yeah. It was great. Come on. And then so, and you for a year? Did you, was your... This was 1969. Uh, but would you stay there for a year? For a year and a couple of months, actually. <laughs> so, but the good thing about it was, besides the money was good, and that was okay, because you got extra pay. Uh, you could only work as a procurement officer. You could only give the contracts to the contracts that were produced by the Air Force. You had to give those to the suppliers, and they were usually construction people. And it was, of course, you had, they had to make the independent bids kind of thing, which they all colluded, whatever. But you could only work when they were. So you could only, you could arrive at 10 o'clock, finish at noon, and then every contractor took a two-hour lunch. So you go back at 2 o'clock until like 4, and you're done for the day. Mm -hmm. 
So in the morning, I'd go work out at the gym. In the afternoon, I went to karate practice. In the evening, I went to the Korean Judo Association. It was great. That was the way it was for a while. There were a couple of instances where, you know, at the Korean Judo Association, you had all kinds of people practicing judo. Uh, a lot of them were in the KCIA. Is that Korean security or intelligence? Korean Central Intelli Intelligence. Crazy. So uh, judo players in Korea, a lot of judo players also did karate uh, or taekwondo. So they were involved in whatever they were involved in. So they took me aside one day and said, uh, we have to talk about something. I said, yeah, what is it? He says, you're the Air Force liaison officer at the Korean Purchasing Agency, KPA. Yeah. He said, you know that uh, you go out with these people, with other people. I said, I only go out with judo players. I, I don't go out with anybody else. So you, you know that you're not supposed to take grads. Yeah, absolutely. He says, you know the contractors will try and get you to take some kind of gratuitous. I said, I'm very aware of that. And I'm very aware that uh, this office is under scrutiny. The OSI has always informed me. says, well, we have a problem with one of your people down at Osan Air Force Base. So they uh, said, you should inform him soon to either stop that or we're going to have to step in. So I immediately called down to Osan. I said, I have to come down to base today. So I went down and I talked to the uh, commanding officer, uh, the procurement officer, I'm sorry, procurement officer. And I said, uh, you, I, let me relay to you something that happened to me these people, and I do this in Seoul, and uh, they have suggested that uh, you cease and desist your relationship with Korean contractors. And if you have received anything, you should return it today. <laughs> or, or, or you're going to be in... He said, he said, well, I said, I don't care. I don't care. I'm the messenger. This is, I'm trying to give you a hand here. Please do what you want. I said, but I just thought that I should bring it to your attention immediately. And so evidently, he got everything cleared up. And then I said that I was fine. I went back, did my job. At the end of 1969, I had separated from the Air Force. Uh, I had gotten my visa for and my passport to go to Japan. And you'd never been to Japan during that time? No. Oh, wait a minute. That's not true. I had, about six months prior, I had, with some friends of mine, we had come to Japan. We climbed to Fuji and okay. yeah, kind of thing. Okay. We stayed at Tachikawa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Then I came, and I came to Japan. I came to Japan with 5,000 yen. and uh, 5,000 yen? 5,000 yen. And a bottle of Johnny Walker Black. Okay. Smart. And, and, a, and a pack of, and a box of cigars. And the reason I had the cigars at Johnny Walker was to sell them on the black market in Kyoto. The reason I went to Kyoto was because when in the Korean Judo Association, a New Zealand fellow was practicing there. He was visiting Korea. And he asked, and I had done well against him. And he was pretty high-ranking degree. And he was surprised that I did well against him. And he said, no. What are you going to do when you, when you finish Air Force? Well, I'm going to go to Japan. I'm going to study at the Kotokan. I'm going to learn Judo. And then I'm going to, going to study there for six months. I'm going to go back to the United States. I'm going to win the American Championships and the Pan American Championships and be a designated to the Olympic Games. Then I'm going to open up my own martial arts school in the United States. That's what I'm going to do. He said, well, that's all well and good. But if you go to the Kotokan, you won't learn anything about the country. You'll probably associate with other Westerners that are at the Kotokan. Why don't you come to Kyoto? He says, that's where I live. And I practice at Doshi University, which is a pretty good university judo club and we can set you up. I said, I don't have a lot of money. And he said, that's all right. I said, we'll set you up until you get on your feet. It's very, very helpful. I said, okay, I'll do that. So I did. Well, the reason I didn't have a lot of money is because there was a, a wonderful Korean woman. I I, mean, I I kid you not. She was just the epitome of, of just a wonderful Wonder person. Yeah. I did some things that uh, I am not. Right. So I gave her all my money. I had about three or $4,000 saved up. And I said, look, I've treated you very badly and I'm very sorry. But I still am going to go to Japan. I'm still going to do what I want. So here is all of my money. And then I had a Korean friend. I said, this is a friend of mine, Yoo Chung Kim, and he's going to help you back on your feet. With that nasty piece of my life behind me, I arrived in Japan with 5,000 yen. But I was very fortunate. I got a job teaching English, which is everybody did at that time. And uh, got back on my feet, went to language school, practiced judo at the university every day, and eventually practiced uh, at the, the police school. And then I practiced in the afternoon and morning at the police school, afternoon at the university, evening at a machi dojo. And that was that. The same uh, New Zealand guy met with, at that time, Clark Hatch. Uh, Jim was a member of the Clark Hatch ship. And Clark Hatch was looking for a floor manager. Jim, instructor. And he had tried with the Japanese instructor. He wasn't happy with them. So he said, this, so the New Zealand guy contacted me in Korea and said, look, this guy is in Kyoto. This guy was a gym manager. What do you think? I said, yeah, I did a great job. He says, why don't you come see him? So I did. So I went up and we sat down with Clark. I talked. He says, well, this is what I'm offering for pay. And this is the, the what you'd like to do. And we've been working together kind of thing, split shifts. You'd be in Kyoto, though? No, no. I, I moved from Kyoto. I moved to Tokyo. Okay. So I said, 
Okay. So he said, well, let me clear some things up and I'll give you contact. What year was this? This was 1973. Okay. So I went early, either that or a lot part of 1972, I forget which. Mm -hmm. But I went back to Kyoto and I didn't hear from him. Actually, it was 1972. No, I remember. So I waited around, no contact. And finally, he sent me and I said, look, I'm opening up my gym in Korea. I said, I don't have time to train another person. So it's not nothing to do with you, but right now I can't proceed. I said, okay. So about two months later, calls your bank and said, look, Korea's all set. I'm all done with that. Why don't you come on up and start? And I said, well, I have to give notice at National Panasonic where I was teaching. He said, sure. So I came up in uh, March of 1973. That was it. I started working at the gym as an instructor. Salary was good. Found an apartment in Mayoro. Everything was good. Then it was, I remember Clark told me once, he said, you know, you can leave the gym once in a while. <laughs> well, I told you that too. <laughs> He said, yeah, he said, but you don't pay me to leave the gym. They said, absolutely, but you don't have to stay there all the time. time. Yeah. You can go out and get something to eat. Yeah. And I said, well, well I met you shortly after. Not, shortly after that. not too long after that. I got not out. too long after that. It wasn't too long after that because I came here in 74, got out in 76. So it was shortly. 77, I think I met you. So you'd been there for a little while. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, no, I was there later than that because I was by myself. Clark wasn't in the picture. He wasn't in the picture yet. I wasn't in the picture. So there had to be... I think he left 78, 79. He went to open up his headquarters in No, it had to be after that because I was I taught at the American School till nineteen eighty and I think it was after I was a teacher at the American School. So it was in the eighties I met you. Yeah. But it was before well before I got married, of course. Yeah. Yeah. When did you get married? What year was it that you got married? Nineteen seventy three. Okay, so just be okay. So I had I had come up from Kyoto, I started to work, and then we worked out Clark and I worked out it, you know, there are a lot of things about Clark hats that are good things, That's right. not so good things, depending on your point of view. Uh, but he pioneered the fitness industry in this country, sure in Asia. He had the first non-smoking restaurant here. Didn't make it, but he had it. Yeah. And he, he, uh, he, he sat down when he says, he says, Chuck, I'm going to have a physical fitness center in every major city in Asia within 10 years. And then he went ahead and did it. He did. He did. it. I mean, you got to hand, talk about vision. And being able to, at that time in Asia, it was the Wild West. I mean, they were, the Philippines, they were still, they were still wearing guns in their hips in the Philippines. You know, it was just crazy stuff. Bribery officials to get the appropriate commits was just the way you did business. That was that. That was fine. Everything was fine. And uh, I met my wife near the Tokyo Tower. They used to have the Masonic swimming pool. Okay, right. And I met her there with some other friends of hers. And uh, we became friendly and... So we went out, we had lunch, and I went to her place, and we had lunch kind of thing, and I, I borrowed some books, and that was it. And from then, her or from where? From her. From her? Yeah. Well, that's how you did it. Okay, so that was your style. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was... <laughs> you any books? Nah, no, no. Yeah. I like the ball. I, at, that, at that point, I did not have an ulterior motive. <laughs> Uh, and I was, well, I had, I, I had other. Well, how'd you borrow books from Bowie? I don't understand this movie. Really she wasn't a librarian, was she? No, but she had books at her place. <laughs> you said, oh. And I said, well, these are, I said, which are your favorite? So which are your favorite? Is that, is this how you came and said, excuse me, um, what are your favorite books? Can I borrow those? So you had to give them back. Awesome. Well, it was, it was not at all. It was not a scam. It was, there was, a, plus the fact I had, I was involved with, well, Okay. Two or three other... All right, right. But it wasn't, but it wasn't Nancy, though. No, These were it wasn't Nancy. Nancy. You didn't borrow books from them, did you? No, I did not. See, it <laughs> was not necessary. <laughs> so, anyways, so then I had to go to Korea because I yeah. couldn't work for Clark Hatch, work on the visa that I had. Because it is one of the English language teaching visas was like all other. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, maids and garbage collectors get the same yeah. visa. Kind of stuff. So I had to go to Korea. Well, I had to stay in Korea while they got my... Visa straight up. Visa straight up. So when I came back, Clark said, this woman's been calling for her books for the last, you know, two weeks. It's, it's all, you God, were sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. So I said, I called her. I said, look, I'm sorry. I'll get your books back. So I brought her books back and we had lunch kind of thing. And then uh, over the course of the next uh, few days, we saw a lot of each other and uh, nothing, nothing untoward at all. And uh, she she knew of my other acquaintances, and uh, that was all all fine. Uh, and then one day, about maybe a month, no, 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 well, maybe a, more more than a couple of months into the relationship, I said, uh, and the relationship was a full blown relationship at that time. And uh, I said, 
what do you think about living together? And she said, with you? And I said, yes. And she said, no. As a matter of fact, I don't like this arrangement. He says, you see me on a couple of days a week, and you see your other friends a couple of days a week. I said, yes, this untenable. Look, she says, I'm not going anywhere. I said, well, you're done fooling around, and you want to settle down? We can talk. This was in, uh, yeah, this was in November. I said, well, so I thought about it for about, I can, very quick, I thought about it for a minute. I said, literally a minute, 60 seconds. No, that's not going to work. How about marriage? And she says, well, what time frame are we talking? I said, well, today's Monday, and I've got a judo contest on Thursday afternoon, but I'm free in the morning. We could do that. Then she said, okay. So we did. That's what I'm talking about. And you've been married ever since. But ever since. So we went, yeah, we went down. There was no ceremony. There was nothing, no reception, nothing. We just went down to the embassy. She got her girlfriend to be the bridesmaid. I got a friend of mine to be the best man kind of thing. We went in in front of the embassy. We got married, went to the ward office, got a thing, and we started living together. Boom. I moved my apartment and I moved my stuff into her place. We started living together, and that was it. And at that time, or very soon after that, Clark said, look, you've been working for me for six months. I'm looking for a partner. I have another person in mind, but you are the person you've been working for me. We seem to work out well together. You've absorbed everything I've got to teach you. Uh, what do you want to do? I says, yeah. I want to do it. And he said, well, it's going to cost you a certain amount of money. So I spent the next month being in the bushes trying to get money. It wasn't a small amount of money. Uh, after I talked to the wife. And she says, well, you, you can do that. Or uh, you can go to school at Jochi, and I will work and support you. I says, no, I don't do that. I says, we will support this family, but I will not depend on you for, if I, I just don't do that. She said, okay. Clark arranged for a friend of his to lend me the money that I paid him. And then with that money, he opened up his gym in Honolulu, where he developed his Asia empire. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And he left the operation of the gym here to me. So I, I had only worked on the floor. and nothing to do with the books, all the monies, and all, uh -huh, nothing about that. So he said one day, after we had got a contract, contract was a good contract, delineated what my rules and responsibilities, what I was going to be kind of compensated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What he wanted, I don't think Clark ever wrote another contract like that in his life because mm -hmm. it was it was very good for both of us. And um, it should, yeah, it should be. And so we got it formalized. He said, "Okay, I'm leaving." As we mean leaving, I'm leaving. This is the income. This is the records. This is the expenses. See you later. And that was it. He was gone. Like within 24 hours. But there's a question I ask at the end: If you could mentally go back in time with all the knowledge you have now and meet the younger Chuck Wilson, what advice would you give him, and how old would he be? I wouldn't give him any advice right. because I have become the person I wanted to be when I was 15. I'm old. That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I do. Chuck, I want to thank you. One of my pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. I want to thank all of you for watching this podcast. Make sure you press like and subscribe, and never forget. It's all on loan, so continue to reach for the star because you're too blessed to be stressed.